All right. Okay, that video is really cool. I wasn't fast enough. My my name was on the like the card that came up, and I couldn't see what the thing was written underneath it. I don't. I hope it wasn't like go straightly to directly to jail or something horrible like that. Um, I need to watch it a bit more closely. Um, so everyone can hear me. Okay, I think. Um, let's get cracking. Um, so yeah, as Oliver says, my name's Phil Hawksworth, uh, and I work up the road at an agency called RGA. Um, hopefully, we'll have some time for questions at the end of this. Uh, uh, but if not, you know, you can you can tweet them at me. My uh, Twitter handle is easy to remember, certainly for me, because it's just my name. Um, but so please feel free to tweet kind of questions or comments um, or, you know, arguments if you disagree with the stuff that I'm saying or, you know, suggestions. Many, maybe, maybe many of you are doing things better than the, what I'm going to be talking about, so I'd like to hear about that. Frankly, if they're just kitten pictures, I'll, uh, I'll be happy to receive them, so, so tweet at me. Um, we'll get into the, the meat of it in just a second, but I just want to do something which I hate seeing people do, and that's this. Uh, I'm looking for front-end developers, enough said. Um, RGA, oh, okay, we'll say a little bit more. Uh, RGA uh, are an agency that build things for clients like Nike and Google, O2, those kind of things, those kind of people. Um, we make products, applications, experiences, all kind of stuff, but I care about the web. You know, I build things for the web. That's my background, and that's the kind of stuff I'm interested in, which is why we're going to be talking about what we're going to talk about. Um, I've ranted about various things before. Um, usually it's kind of centered around the fact that I love the web. You know, I really enjoyed hearing John talk earlier on about you know, some of the history of the web and some of the, some of the things that we care about so much and what makes it so valuable. Um, I often think that I really love the web you know, right down to you know, the URL. I love URLs so deeply that might make me a uh, boring company at parties, uh, but, uh, but so be it. You know, I, I love URLs in spite of people like Alex Sexton uh, ruining them for me by mentioning that you know, every URL has HTTP double meh at the beginning. Um, there it is, uh, just in case you weren't sure that's what he's talking about. And once you've seen that, you cannot unsee it. You know, uh, we're going to see it again. Yeah. My, my click is uh, determined to slow me down. Oh, well, it's in there. You've seen it now. You can't unsee it. Uh, We'll go through all of these slides again, shall we? There we go. Hey, it's a lot of work just to see him. OK, we've got a bit of a lag. I'll try and, I'll try and see. You love it the second time around. So it seems like we're going to be seeing it a third and a fourth. Who knows? Um, I talk a lot about kind of things to do with CMSs as well, um, you know, the, the mess that CMSs can make of, uh, of your sites. Um, I find it hard to understand how to pluralize content management systems, CMSs, CMS, CMSs. I don't know. Oh, oh there's lag on here. I'm going to go. I'm going manual. Uh, it's, it's tricky, and punchlines are ruined. Um, but it's great to see you know, the kind of work that people like Rachel Andrew are doing on, on products like Perch that make this space much easier, much more clean and efficient. Love that kind of stuff. Um, all of these things that I talk about tend to be because you know, building for the web is hard. You know, it's really difficult. It's a difficult landscape. There's a lot for us to think about, you know, whether that's down to just the fact that you know, we don't know what devices there are we're going to be building for, this is scary, there are three of me right now up here, um, frightening. Um, you know, we don't know what devices there are, what, what uh, viewports we're building for. Brad Foss sometimes talks about not knowing what devices are coming under the Christmas tree. You know, we have to build for a bit of an unknown environment. You know, the, the viewports that we build for, um, you know, they're, they could be anything, you know, and they're varied from every site has, you know, a different profile of the kind of viewports that exist and have, have, uh, have visited them and trying to cater for that is just incredibly difficult. So given all of these things that are hard to do, then I'm very interested in trying to remove some of these, these obstacles, these obstructions to, to quality. And also kind of removing the obstructions to longevity, because you know, one of the fantastic things about the web is that it lives for a long time. You know, the, uh, the ability to have uh, links that exist and, and persist over time so that you can reliably follow them is something that's, that's key. And, Building things in some ways is harder to maintain them than others. You know, we've, uh, we recognize, excuse me, I'm flashing around quite a lot. Um, okay. Uh, you know, we recognize this. I I'm, think I'm amazed that I might be the first person to show this today. I imagine it might be shown a couple of more times before the end of the day's up. But, you know, the first site uh, is still around. The very web first web page is there because, you know, it has, it's, it's robust and it has some longevity. Um, and it's that simplicity that 
you know, I strive for and I think is incredibly valuable and often overlooked. So there's this, this mantra of bake, don't fry uh, when it comes to you know, either serving sites up uh, bespoke, you know, they're fried when a user comes to find them, so they make a request and then you create the site or you populate it and you deliver it to them, or you bake it in advance. You, know, you, you bake it, it's static, and then you serve it when people come for it. And it wasn't Paul Hollywood uh, who coined that. It was, uh, of course, um, the late, great Aaron Swartz who, who coined this phrase or certainly popularized it. And he did this you know, when he was talking and thinking about something that is probably quite familiar to lots of us, his blog. You know, creating a blog site is something that a lot of us have done, uh, and it should be simple. And often it is simple. There are great tools to help us along the way. But there's some, there are some moving parts. And Aaron was thinking about this, and that's where he kind of, this resonated with him. And in particular, because he was th saying, you know, I care about not having to maintain cranky AOL server, Postgres, and Oracle installs. I can relate to that. You know, try, you think you're going to create something static, something simple, something that's going to be read by hopefully lots of people, but you don't have to write too often. Um, but there's all these bits and pieces, these bits of plumbing that you have to, have to work on uh, to get that to happen. And this obviously isn't new. You know, Aaron was talking about this in 2002, where he you know, was using all those bits of plumbing and then discovered something called WebMake, which was a Perl-based static site generator, 2002. And it wasn't perfect, and it's, you know, I think we've come a long way since then. But you know, he identified that you know, that was a really good fit for something where there were you know, few writes and many, many reads. You know, the OR architecture can be slightly different. And he strove for that simplicity. So simplicity doesn't sound very Hollywood. You know, this, trying to sex up a, a, a talk on static site generators by including the word Hollywood in the title. Um, but you know, I think actually simplicity is, is beautiful. Um, and one thing that it is not is dumbing down. You know, we're not dumbing down when we're talking about simplifying. As I mentioned, there's plenty of places for complexity to live within our sites. And uh, you know, we've all been stung by having to build all kinds of complex experience in, experiences. And any place that we can simplify uh, is great. You know, that's not to say that I want every page to look like this and every site to look like this. You know, there's complexity and beauty that can live on in the design without us dumbing that down. Um, and that's a kind of a sticky, sticky subject at the moment, I think, especially with lots of the kind of patterns that exist, lots of conventions that are starting to form, uh, formalize uh, that we're adopting. This, this illustration was done by a friend of mine, a, a really talented designer uh, and illustrator, who hated it when I was trying to battle some of the complexity in the front end, in the design, um, on a project that we worked on once upon a time. He even, you know, was saying to me, please don't take away my Flash, you know, which is what we're, you know, we're building something in Flash at the time. He said, we're going to build it out of the web. And his illustration, I don't know if you can just see the subtle thing that he had there with something taking Flash away from him. Uh, you know, there are lots of opinions about you know, how the design can get dumbed down. But that's not what we're talking about. We're not, we're not talking about the design per se. We're talking about the architecture. And critically, you know, the fact that simplifying isn't dumbing down. It lets us focus on what's important. It lets us... Um, uh, really optimizing the right places. So just a couple of moments about the benefits. I'm not going to go into too much depth on this, because uh, there's other material around that I can refer people to. But just, just by a, a, quick, uh, a quick list of some of the benefits of, of hosting something statically and serving static sites. First of all, that hosting environment is going to be much, much cheaper and simpler. You know, Many of us have encountered things like GitHub pages, where you can host things for free. But there are much more sophisticated static, static hosting environments around now, which are certainly cheap and quite powerful. One of the reasons is there's you know, fewer points of failure there. You know, we have less plumbing, less things that are less moving parts, um, and fewer vulnerabilities, because ultimately we're serving static assets. We're serving, serving static files from our hosting environment. So there are, there are a few points of uh, uh, attack vectors and what have you. Um, it's not exciting, but that actually makes for easier compliance. The kind of clients that I work with often have their own large you know, internal IT infrastructure teams and hosting environments, and they're very, very careful about what code you can run in their environments, rightly so. They've got infrastructure to protect. Um, even the kind of tools that you and I might use quite frequently and think are quite safe, they'll expose those to a great deal of scrutiny, and either they can be very slow to be able to deploy things there, or they'll just you know, embargo lots of that kind of infrastructure completely. 
So this, this approach makes it easier to comply with that. Makes it easier to move around as well. You know, serving something over here that's static is very similar to serving something over here. You've got great portability of what you're, what you're creating. And there are other things like, you know, nice sandbox environments. You know, it's very easy to encapsulate your development environment and have it be the same as on your, your production environments. And this notion of avoiding attrition as well. You know, serving something statically, you know, there's not a lot that's necessarily going to change there. Whereas if you've got an environment that's got you know, different server-side um, uh, languages running or databases to query, that kind of thing, then those need to be upgraded over time. And sometimes you can kind of fall foul of this kind of attrition where the environment degrades or gets updated around you and then things break. Um, you know, I don't want to, to criticize WordPress. I think it's a fantastic project, uh, product, really enabled a lot of things. But you know, I've, I've encountered this. I don't know if any other people who've uh, had the blog of their own at some point have had pages like this or this. This, this is my favorite error page because it says, error, 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 success, hey! uh, which is always confusing to me. Um, and as I say, I'm not bashing WordPress. We use WordPress uh, for many things uh, at RGA, um, who are hiring. Uh, and, um, uh, but <laughs> I've distracted myself there with my subtle plug. Uh, you know, we, use, we use WordPress all over the place, um, but it's not suitable for everything. And you know, it can bring some pain, as, long, as well as any other kind of piece of uh, technology that has infrastructure behind it. So are, are static sites really credible? Surely we always need something in the back end that's going to be dynamic to serve these things. Well, actually, there are plenty of examples that I'll just call on very briefly just to, to point out that actually, you know, static sites are not only viable, they, they're doing incredible work. I mean, this, again, is not, this isn't a very recent example. This is from 2012, so a few years ago. Um, and many, did, did many people see this uh, at the time? Uh, a couple of nodding, nodding heads. Um, yeah, so Carl Rush, who, was, who worked on the, the campaign, the, the, um, the fundraising campaign for, a, for Obama, so again, that dates it, um, re-architected their entire platform to be a statically generated site. Um, you know, and that was, that was huge, you know, to, to take that punt, especially when you're entering an environment where it's all a very enterprisey landscape that's going to have you know, people deploying expensive, trusted, reassuringly expensive tools there, to then go and use something uh, like Jekyll, you know, bake, bake the site out with Jekyll to serve a very large audience, critically to have rapid iterations, um, you know, and host that statically. That's, that was quite bold, but you know, incredibly successful, you know, a good example of a credible um, uh, static site out in the, out in the wild. Um, a project that uh, we worked on uh, was, was something that you may have encountered if you're uh, a web developer, um, Google Web Fundamentals, which is Again, a statically generated site. Um, and this is something that we, we built with the Chrome team uh, that includes all kinds of articles, posts. It behaves very much like a blog, but it's very, very rich. There's lots of content in there. Um, and again, you know, this is the content is hosted on GitHub. You can go and fork it and contribute to it there. Um, it's baked out again with Jekyll into some static sites, and then that is, is hosted uh, statically by Google. So you know, a fairly mainstream example. And this, is another, this is a great one of, of that that need to reduce the risk. You know, deliver an agency external to somewhere like Google, writing code for them to host on their .com domain, they're very cautious about that, and rightly so. There's lots of security implications that, are, that go along with that. So the fact that you can bake something out statically that can go through their various audits um, means that you can actually get things into that infrastructure and, and out to the public in the way that you'd want. Um, another example. Uh, Google Year in Search, which is, used to be called the Zeitgeist, um, people may have encountered at the end of every year, um, which is, again, built out statically. Um, and this is, this is something we worked on at the end of last year. And it's a, a very large audience because it has a big kind of marketing push around it. And you know, the characteristics of this site, so it's, it's infrequently updated, which makes it a really good contender for statically generated sites. Um, and it should have a long life. You know, there should be you know, marking a point in time, so it should, it should persist for a really long time. So, of course, that makes it a good contender. Um, you know, the, the site is not huge. It's built out of 40 different stories, um, but that's, those have been translated into 52 different languages, so, you know, it scales up quite rapidly. And, you know, I said there was a, a marketing push around this site, and, you know, there are over two and a half billion impressions on social pushing people towards this. I don't have the actual traffic site, uh, stats on the, on the site anymore, but it's the kind of thing that I wouldn't want to have to build out complex infrastructure to host. Hosting it statically made, made the world a difference for us. 
Um, you know, and then similar to the, to the other examples, you know, the, the content's abstracted out so that it can be managed externally and then consumed by these templates. And it's baked out with something called Goro, which is just another static site generator. This one is a Python-based one that's internal at Google that you use for various things. And then they host it statically. So I guess what I'm trying to say there is, you know, this is already mainstream. I'm not showing you something that's, uh, that's necessarily groundbreaking or new. It's all around us already. But we often kind of overlook this approach because we assume that we need something more complex. In actual fact, we can build things that feel quite complex and quite fresh because there are lots of tools that enable us to do that. And the key ones really, the two of the key ones, are, are generators and templating. Now, this is a crowded space. There are lots of static site generators around. Um, this site, staticsitegenerators.net, is a static site from a static site generator. Um, and it's, it's fairly dynamic because every time I kind of go and tweak these slides, I have to change the number. Um, yesterday, there were 393 of these things, um, which is hard to keep up with if you're someone like me who likes playing with new, new toys and sees another one of these static site generators coming around. I kind of talk about the hipster tax sometimes, the, the price you pay of, of playing with the new tools and always wanting to be on the bleed, bleeding edge. Um, but nonetheless, there are incredible tools that are around, and we'll, we'll touch on a couple of those in a second. But most people are familiar with things like Jekyll, which is the the kind of canonical example of a static site generator. Using these tools has some lovely side effects. You know, this is not exclusive to static site generators, but it's something that's occasionally overlooked as a capability of these things. Now, if you're building things out with templates uh, and generating things from those, then you can have this nice side effect of creating a style guide. Side effect maybe is a bit flippant, but it's certainly an artifact of the build. Um, and if you do it right, really, you know, the style guide forms part of the process. I mean, people may be familiar with principles like atomic design and creating uh, sites from building blocks that inherit from you know, lower and lower down the chain. Um, again, there's lots of other talk about that kind of thing, so I'm not going to go into depth. Um, you know, uh, it's wonderful being able to expose as part of your site a style guide that other people can see, that you can help inform the design process and other people can learn on. That's certainly one of the things that was an output on the on the uh, Web Fundamentals project. Um, and the way that that can work very often, you know, is that you'll be, bu you'll be building up a, a palette of these modules, perhaps, you know, using a, a, an atomic design approach. Um, and those modules, those components, will get incorporated into templates, go through some kind of build process, which would usually just be, you know, your static site generator. They'll be consuming those things, generating the templates, and then outputting in this case, a style guide. Um, and that's something that can live on and you can iterate and you can, you can build up over time. Um, and then often you'll you know, include in your build some kind of deployment process uh, to push that somewhere that people can see it as well so it doesn't just live in the development environment. And then it's very simple to expand on this by adding some more templates which are consuming the same modules and those are also consuming your content. And they, they go through the same mechanic, through the same static site generator, and they produce your, your live site. And the key here um, you know, is the fact that the same, the same modules are being kind of transcluded into the, into the templates uh, for the style guide as they are into the production uh, uh, version of the site. I'm kind of happy to use the word transcluded after, I think, uh, John uh, this morning mentioned Ted Nelson, who coined the word transclusion. Um, he... Uh, he coined that phrase along with intertwingularity, which I noticed John mentioned. Uh, he also coined the phrase hypertext uh, and hypermedia, uh, all of which John mentioned. John didn't mention uh, uh, teledildonics, which is the other uh, term that, that Ted Nelson uh, coined. Tiptoed around that as also with cyber dildonics, which is another thing that Ted Nelson uh, coined. Uh, he didn't coin blue dildonics, but that was a, a, a later derivation of that. Getting off the point of static site generator at some point, but kind of uh, amazing to think of the things that came out of Ted Nelson's head. Anyway, back to the point. Um, so, you know, we can tr the, the key is to, to use the same source for your modules that go into your style sheets, and sorry, your style guides, and also into your production sites. Um, unless those two things are, are, are bound together, unless, you know, it's part of your build, your style guide just becomes documentation. 
You know, it's just another thing for you to have to maintain, and it always falls behind. So binding these two things closely together, you know, the generation of your style guide and, the, and the, the, the compilation of your components and modules that you use in your site, binding those together through a suitable build process is critical. And so you know, it's things like automation that make this happen. I'm not going to touch on too much on this because Andy Smith's going to do a talk on, uh, on, on some of this stuff tomorrow, I believe. Um, but you know, there are tools and there are some names that are familiar to a bunch of us now, things like Gul uh, Grunt, Gulp, Brunch, all of these are, are you know, um, are task automators. Belch, I imagine, is coming. Burp, cough, sneeze, are all, they're all on the horizon. Um, obviously, a few people familiar with those already. We're back in the, hip, uh, the hipster, hipster tax zone uh, there. But, you know, we've got two days. I imagine there'll be a build automation tool built in JavaScript called Sneeze by the end of that. Um, but these things are great because, you know, they allow us to deploy faster and to deploy safer. You know, it's not just about compiling the site. It's actually about putting it in the right place. And static site generators have really you know, come to fruition because of some of these tools that allow us to deploy fa faster and to deploy more safely, which means that we can update sites faster. You know, when you reduce the friction to deploying your changes, you know, feels, things start to feel much more dynamic. But eventually, you know, we'll, we hit the ceiling because the kind of tools that we put in place to do this, they kind of need a bit of a developer mindset. You know, we're talking about um, committing things to repositories, firing uh, build automated tools, all those kind of things. And it, it feels a bit like it's in the developer mindset. Uh, and you know, that's, a developer mind mindset isn't always very Hollywood and very accessible. Um, occasionally, Hollywood has a go at the developer mindset, but it doesn't always represent what I recognize uh, as, as what developers are about. Um, but, you know, we, clients still want that shizzle, that exciting, you know, uh, site with the, with the feels dynamic. And of course, they still want to be able to manage the content themselves, trying not to fork back, in, back into a content management talk, but uh, there's an overlap here. Um, so we should look at some of the common complexity of, of a site that's not static and see how we can, we can change that. So let's just kind of walk through a, a, a simple example you know, of... Um, you know, of a site that would have some templates or some views that we serve to a user. Uh, and those views are going to be populated according to some kind of logic that executes on the server when the server makes a request. You know, perhaps the, the user is making a request for something of, that's particular to them, maybe a, a profile or something that's, that's individual to them. Um, and of course, that's going to then reach back and grab some data, populate the templates, and then deliver those of, as views. We'll probably put some kind of caching in front of that to speed things up. So, you know, whenever there's repeated uh, steps through all of that logic, we can, we can try and cut to the chase and serve something from the cache. Um, and we've got something then that's viable and we can serve to users. Now, we, we want to update that stuff as well, and there's some, there's some mechanic going on there. So often what happens is we'll create some kind of admin view of that, some kind of content management view that lets people change the content without having to get into the code. And those will be served from another set of templates and views, and those will you know, require some kind of server logic to render those and probably reach back into the same data and manipulate that data as well. And that'll be wrapped up in some kind of production environment, maybe on a server, maybe on a number of servers. You know, that it could be many bits of pieces in this infrastructure. Then we're going to have a staging environment. Then if we're being good, we should have a QA environment. We're going to have development environments for the developers working on that. And all of these are going to be some kind of facsimile of, of the production environment. Probably not identical, but in many places, replicating it as closely as possible. So there's a lot of, lot of moving parts here. There are a lot of places for us to maintain the software, maintain the libraries that are on there, keep that all working together and talking, talking together. And so in the spirit of you know, trying to reduce complexity, I look at that infrastructure and I think, where can we use other people's plumbing? Now, other people's plumbing is an unpleasant expression. I apologize for that. Um, but you know, there are tools that we can use where other people shoulder the burden of the, the complexity. So let's look at an example of that. So we've got our developer environments in this case, which has got a static site generator, the kind of tools that I've been referring to all along, perhaps something like Jekyll or one of the other 393 uh, on that list. Um, some kind of build mechanics there to run that static site generator. In its simplest form, we wouldn't even need that. That's included within the, the, the generator itself. 
And at that point, you know, we could be rendering pages out and serving them, uh, on, deploying them to a production environment and just serving them to the user. That's very, fairly simple, but we're missing some of the pieces of the, of the puzzle that we had before. You know, where's this uh, content administration piece? Well, it turns out that we can abstract that. We can take that away, and there are, there are tools popping up that actually provide this as a service. They'll host this for you. And they'll serve the content management admin for you. You know, they'll serve it from their environment, from their site, um, and then make that content available uh, once it's been populated by uh, content authors to your build. You know, they'll expose it through APIs, through other mechanics. And so then your build in your development environment reaches out to this content repository, pulls it in, generates the templates, and once again, we can just deploy those to the environment. But we want to go a bit further than that, really. We want to be able to you know, easily make sure that changes are deployed to the environment. So there's also deployment uh, services as a service, um, which can you know, start monitoring your, your repository wherever code changes are made, that triggers a build to happen because it knows about your build environment, fires off the build, and then deploys that for you. So you don't even need to push anymore. You know, it's very much the kind of model that you've seen on GitHub pages. You push to a repository, generates the build, outputs it. Not, not very, very new, but it's the kind of thing that's incredibly powerful, especially when you start linking these two things together. So, you know, so now, not only do uh, changes to your code manifest in a build being populated automatically, but also changes to the content on this third-party service, those trigger a build as well. So, so this tool can be monitoring that and, and compiling a build for you at the same time. So this means that through a static, what is effectively a static site that you're, that you're maintaining, content authors can trigger a build without even knowing about it. They can publish a build. Um, people changing code can do the same thing. But you could argue, well, that's not really simplifying. You've got the same things going on there. It's just that you've moved the boxes around a little bit. And well, I'd say yeah, that's true. But what we're talking about here is about shifting complexity and kind of outsourcing the complexity so that you don't need to maintain that. I really believe quite strongly in putting some distance between the user and the complexity. And that's you know, not just talking about the UI, but also talking about infrastructure and failure points and that kind of thing. I think when you can do this, then you protect the user from the kind of failures that you can sometimes see. Now, if you're able to source the content at build time rather than at execution time when the server's uh, serving its request from the user, um, then you can simplify things a lot and you can, you can really uh, smooth out some of the, the problems in performance and, uh, and, and risk. Things like Jekyll do that really well. You know, there's a data model now in Jekyll where you can drop files into a, a, a folder, and those files, if they're constructed out of YAML, you know, just a, a structured data format, then those become objects that you can access in your templates. And that's great because it means that, you know, you could have content authors just maintaining a file of what looks like a fairly structured piece of content, and your build can be triggering off the back of that. But it's, I don't think that's as palatable to content authors as something like Contentful, which is, you know, this CMS as a service, if you like. Now, Contentful, which I really recommend checking out, um, gives you this hosted CMS interface. It exposes that through an API, which you can configure quite, quite heavily, um, and it creates you different versions of the API. It supports translations and, and localization, so you know, you, the kind of thing that would be quite a pain to build out in a CMS, or is quite expensive in kind of enterprise-level CMSs. Um, you know, it supports that for you and gives you a UI for that. And also, kind of the other stuff that is kind of it's the heavy lifting of building out something that's content-driven, you know, user roles and management for the different kinds of access to monitor, to manage this content. It kind of does that for you. And it kind of gives you different, it exposes things to different environments and versions and all of those good things. But critically what it does is it's decoupling the content administration from the, the production environment. You, know, you don't have to worry about that anymore. And if that were to go down, your production site is not affected because you have the stage in the middle which is actually combining these things and baking out something statically. And so, you know, Contentful kind of fills this, this piece over here, this, uh, this piece of the puzzle. And you can use that, you know, in lots of different ways. You know, I keep on referring to Jekyll. Other static site generators are available. Um, keep on referring to Jekyll, and there are plugins for that which are specifically designed to consume those APIs from Contentful at the time that you generate the site and populate your template. It makes it incredibly simple to do that. 
Um, another static site generator that I'm really enjoying at the moment is called Roots, which is built entirely out of JavaScript. Um, it's, uh, it's very, very modular, and all of the different pieces of, the, of this tool uh, are really well engineered, and that does a fantastic job of sourcing content from an external API from a feed and then combining that into the templates as well. So when it comes to hosting these things, you know, we had this box that was the production host. Um, you know, there, there are tools now that exist which I kind of think of hosting plus or hosting with benefits, however you want to phrase it. Um, and a great contender for that is something called Netlify. Um, there are a few others around, but this one I particularly, particularly like at the moment. Um, and that fills, you know, that fills this, this last box here, this uh, uh, deployment as a service and, in fact, also as the, the hosting as well. It combines this and simplifies this infrastructure even more. Um, it used to be called Bitballoon. Um, and anyone who's, who's experimented that before might kind of recognize that this very simple flow they had on their site where you just, you know, you have a site that you've generated and you just drag it onto their, onto their, their site and it will you know, upload all of those assets, you know, um, piece them together, deploy them to an environment for you, uh, and then create like a, um, a subdomain and host those for you. Incredibly, incredibly simple for you to, to go from nothing to something hosted uh, in, just, you know, in just a heartbeat. Um, but then it gets interesting after that when they start including things like commit hooks and being able to, to run your build for you rather than just deploy your, your, your assets. Um, and in that instance, what we, what we do is we link it to a repository so, you know, uh, so Netlify can, can watch for activity on that, on that repository. So we're just authenticating there with, uh, with our GitHub account. Um, finding the different projects there, and when we select one of them, um, what it will do is it will actually look at the code that's on there and start to recognize if they're, you know, what the characteristics of it are. Is it a Roots project? Is it a Jekyll project? Is it something else? Um, and it will find the, the build file for that, or if it's, you know, if it's, if it's Grunt or Gulp, it will find that for you. Uh, and then when you run that, it will actually install the dependencies in its environment for you, um, exactly the same as you would in your own uh, development environment. Um, build the site deploy it in the same way. Now, once it's done that for the first time, those dependencies are installed, so subsequent deploys are lightning fast. Um, and this is a great way of having the exact same environment in your production environment to your staging, to your, to your dev environment, being able to kind of keep things the same and a known quantity is just really powerful. And this has a command line interface so you don't have to do things through the web, um, which just makes it really, really fast for you to deploy sites uh, to whichever environment you choose. You know, and it's got things like webhooks, so it can be listening for changes in, for example, Contentful, so that can trigger a build at the same time. Um, has things like notifications, so that you can see if, if a deploy's happened or if, it's, uh, or if it's failed or what have you. And it also gives you control of, of things like the HTTP headers, so you can control things like basic auth, uh, caching, it's quite a lot of control that it gives you in a very, very simple way. Um, and so that kind of fills in that last piece of the puzzle. Now, of course, this isn't suitable for everything. I imagine there are plenty of people in the room scratching their heads and going, yeah, this is all well and good, but my project, that won't work for, work for me. And of course, that's true. You know, there are certain limitations that exist around this. You know, things, sites that have a heavy level of personalization where individuals will be getting delivered something that's very bespoke to them, it's not particularly suitable for this. Very, very large sites with you know, vast numbers of pages where you have to start thinking, what's the generation, what's the build time if for, for a static site generator that's going to build all of these things up every time I make a change? Sites like um, uh, generators like Hugo, which are built on Go, are incredibly rapid for, for rendering templates, uh, rendering pages. So actually, the, the threshold is quite high. But you know, the Guardian might not want to do it. Um, User-generated content, you know, that's another, another uh, uh, issue here. You know, it's, it's not always possible to support that. However, there are, there are tools that are starting to, to pop up to, to help with that as well, that you know, leave the, the content in at build time. So kind of wrapping things up a little bit, I guess the message I'm trying to, to, to bring here is that you know, simply, simplifying production environments is a huge win. You know, for all of the, the reasons that I kind of went through before. Um, putting distance between your users and complexity is incredibly valuable. You know, it, it, makes, it raises your level of confidence. Um, 
and it makes things much more robust. Static site generators you know, and build automation are really starting to mature quite nicely now. Um, I know we've had an explosion in a number of those, but some of those individually are starting to really mature and becoming quite rich and powerful. Um, and like the, the kind of hosting tools, the powerful hosted tools like Contentful, Netlify, and, and, a, and a bunch of others are really starting to address some of what usually would be things that limit us being able to use static site gener generators in the first place. Um, also, you know, the job interview process at RGA is unlike the one in Swordfish. Um, can't, can't stress that enough. Um, and so finally, you know, there's a bunch of links uh, in the slides for things that I've mentioned. Uh, I'll be sharing these online. Um, we do have a few minutes, I think, potentially for questions, but whether we do it or we don't, thank you very much for listening. Thanks a lot.